If you were here with us last week, I, I shared with you uh, as, as we go through the scriptures, you know, and certainly um, our world over the last 16, 17, 18 weeks, um, over the last four or so months has experienced quite uh, an, an eruption uh, quite between the pandemic and then some of the evil we have seen and obviously in, in, in the racism and, and murder and stuff that we've seen play out in, in our land, there's just been global upheaval, global disruption. And so as we walk through times like this, obviously there are things that are very traumatizing. Uh, there are things that are very challenging. And the one thing I've done is I've looked through the scriptures that I'm just blown away and I'm encouraged by so many of the prophets in the Old Testament as I read through and understand the conditions they walk through and how they landed well. I'm like, how can anybody land well? And I'll, I'll give a little backdrop uh, again a little bit later on, but I shared some of it last week. I'm talking about being stripped from your homeland, um, ha- having your city laid waste, having the, the temple of God destroyed. Um, even I pointed out Daniel, who we'll look at later today, having even his capacity to have children taken from him and being in a foreign land and wondering, God, where are you in the midst of all this? And how are you fulfilling your promises? And yet seeing how the Lord uses him and seeing how God honors his promises. And I'm just like, Lord, what do the prophets have? What does your word have that helps us as we walk through 2020? Uh, we're joking with some, some other folks the other day, but man, how many of you feel like this? Uh, let me reflect like this. This year, we're in mid-June, and I can tell you that I've been in two nations already this year. I've been in Israel, and I've been in Rwanda, and both of those, which were only in the last few months, feel like lifetimes ago. I mean, how much has happened in 2020 that makes you feel like we've lived 10 years and we're not even completed six months? Come on, some things have been so intense. So how can God help us to land well while we walk through very real, very serious challenges as we live in this day? What do we have here? And that's where I said what I, what I notice in the scriptures is this whole concept that the prophets and the people of God show us something. And there's something, it's not just in one place, it's littered just littered throughout the Bible, blatantly in our face, and yet it's something that we're not really acquainted with, and that is, it is the prayer of lamentation. The prayer of lamentation. So I want to come back to our concept of a need for lament, and I have some things specifically here, but I just want to kind of map this out, set it up, and then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take you into the two points I want to do today very quickly. All right, because I want to look at a man's life that illustrates this whole process of lamentation because there's something in here for us. Come on, say, say there's something in here for me. God wants to speak through his word, all right? So when we look at lamentation, we see it from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, if you look in the Psalms, of the 150 Psalms, there are close to 60 that deal with this whole concept of praying or singing a lamentation. Now, lamentation is more than just expressing sorrow or venting. Here's the deal. Let me give you the definition. Lamenting or lamentation talks to God about pain and it has a unique purpose that you finish with trust. So you come to God with pain, but you walk away trusting him. It's a divine invitation by God to allow us to pour out our griefs, our frustrations, our pain, and our hurt, but it doesn't end there. The whole purpose of it is that at the end, it reaffirms our faith in God. Simply stated, lament is prayer and pain that ends in trust. Let me say that again. Lamentation biblically is very, very faith-based. It's a prayer that begins in pain, but it ends in trust. I wonder how many of us are familiar with praying these type of prayers. Some people are like, oh, I've got the pain part. Oh, I've got the pain part, but I don't necessarily walk out with the trust part. Or some people say, well, I'm all about the trust, but you never acknowledge the pain. And I'm just here to tell you, all, it's all important. As Christians, we know the promises of God. We know that the tomb is empty, that Jesus is risen, but it doesn't mean that you and I don't experience sorrow, pain, grief, hardship, challenge. We do. We live in a world that's been impacted by sin, and so we are meant to feel at times the weight of these things and take them to God, right? If we don't lament, if we don't lament, if we don't express sorrow with God, here's what happens. Our pain can be exploited, meaning our pain can be used to make us bitter. It can be used to make us anguish, and just it can make our hearts grow cold. We can disconnect from God and from other people. If we don't take the time to deal with the things that are in front of us and to take them to the Lord, 
and I mean take them strong to the Lord, then you can explode or you can implode. And that's just not how we're designed to live. The Lord puts over a third of the Psalms. He puts all these tons of scriptures. He takes men like uh, David. He takes men like Ezekiel. He takes men like Jeremiah. He takes men like Daniel in the Bible and others, even Jesus on the cross. He shows us the prayers of lament to help us to know that in your prayer diet, It's not all about confessing all the blessings and all the promises that there are real times of honest, heart-wrenching, tears, challenge that you bring to prayer and that God is able to deal with, but there are moments of faith in these prayers of lamentation. So what I want to do is I want to take us back to the lamentation that we used last week. I want to read it. I want to give us the, recap the two points from last week very quickly, give us the two points of today, and then we are going to go full on and look at the example of one young man, and I believe and I know that Jesus is going to speak because this is his word. This is his word. So here we go. If you have a Bible, if you have papyrus or a scroll, if you have, by chance, a digital device, whatever it is, I want you to go to Psalm chapter 13, and we're going to start in verses 1 through 6, and again, I'll give you the, the points early because there's something here for us to glean, and then we're going to move it forward. So Psalm chapter 13, verses 1 through 6, this is an example, and I'm going to use this to point out our, our four points of lament. I did two last week. Here we go. David writing. This is a song, by the way. You know, so I think sometimes this is how our, our prayer life is, right? All right, so Psalm 13, verses 1 through 6. Here's David. He says, notice what he's doing. He's turning to God. How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? This, this is pain. This is dealing with something. How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul? How, how many know it's not good to take counsel in your soul? When your mind and your will and your emotions are calling the shot, you and I are a train wreck. Having sorrow in my heart daily. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? And I, I just want you to hear this. David is laying this out. He's like, look, things are not going well. I'm, I'm depressed. I'm hurting. I've got my emotions on full display. And my enemy, seemingly, what I'm, what I'm looking at is triumphing over me. But here's the pivot, verse 3. Come on, feel the pivot. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. In other words, come on, God, raise me up. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed against him. In other words, I'm your child, God. And as your child, I'm a child of the king. Raise me up. I might stand up today, I don't know. Lest my enemy say, I prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. Verse 5, but I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Verse 1, how long, O Lord? Verse 6, I will sing to the Lord for he has dealt bountifully with me. It starts in pain, it ends in trust. The pivot is, come on, the pivot is I begin to pray the word of God. So let's bring this all in. Let me, let me sum up the two points from last week and then I'm going to take us into the two points today and then let's finish strong by looking at a, a man here in the Bible that's very, very encouraging to us and that we're going to do a whole series on later in the fall. All right, so what's the first thing that David does? He's got all this stored up inside of him. What happens? He turns, number one, we talked about this. He turns to prayer or he turns to God with prayer. Number one, how long, O Lord? Lord, I'm coming to you because why? You're the author and the perfecter of my faith. You are God above. You started this whole thing with creation. Sin entered and you did not leave us alone. Sin tried to hijack this whole thing. Death has worked in the earth. But Lord, you have sent your son. You have redeemed. We have creation. We have the fall of man. We have redemption. And then God, you have promised a restoration. There is a story that you're weaving in the earth. And if I'm walking through something, you're the only one I can turn to. Again and again and again in the midst of this story. So David turns to God in prayer. I said this last week and I want to say it again. One of the best ways that you and I can honor what Jesus has done on the cross is to run into the presence of God and find grace and mercy in our time of need. If you're hurting, if you're jacked up, 
if you're being impacted, if you're sorrowful, if you're overwhelmed, the cross has ripped open the heavens. There is a high priest who has ascended into the heavens and opened up and given you and I access. Take advantage of your capacity, of my capacity to turn to God in prayer. When we don't pray, what we are saying is that there are better ways and better instances by which we can manage our time and solve our problems. The Lord did not open the heavens so we could stare in and say, well, that's just so lovely. Isn't that precious? He made a way for us to boldly access the throne. Let's turn to God in prayer with our deepest and hardest things. This needs to be what we do. Otherwise, we don't land well. Worldly sorrow would chase us from God. Lamentation says, I'm running right to God. All right? What's the sorrow? I said, number one, turn to God in prayer. That's number one. Two, bring your complaints. Pour out your heart. What is weighing you down? What is impacting you? Don't let it keep rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling. Bring it to the Father. And here's the thing I want to just encourage you about. The prayer room, the throne room of heaven is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you brought your complaint at 8, you can bring it again at 9. If you brought it at 9, you could bring it at 9.15. If you brought it at 10, you could bring it at 10.30. You keep taking it to him and pouring your heart to him because the only way you and I get aligned right is when we step into the chiropractor office of God and pour out our heart and let his word align us. We complain, we have pain in this world, why? Because this world is marred by sin. And I'm not being fatalistic, I just wanna be very, very real. We tend to forget that we live in a world in which sin is very, very present. Listen, you don't need to go any further than death to understand that something's not natural. Death is unnatural because sin exists in this world. Cancer is unnatural just because sin exists in this world. Injustice, evil, hate, the degrading of other human beings made in the image of God, i.e. racism, is sin. And it's in this world and we feel the weight of it. It's unnatural. It lets us know something's not right in this world. Divorce, child abuse, sexual abuse, molestation, perversion, foul language, animosity, suicide, all of these things let us know that this world is impacted by sin and we feel it. It's not natural because it's not the way that this has been designed to be. I need us to hear that. And sometimes, especially as Americans living in this country, or if you've come from another country and, and you've come to live here, you'll notice that there's this cultural change where it's, it's about, I, I want everything in my life to do and be well and we love, I want to prosper and all that. And, that, and God wants that. But sometimes we get so into that, we forget that there's a world in pain. And so when we experience pain and trauma, it's almost like, Lord, why is this happening? God wants us to go to him, but we are to be burdened. Let me say this again. We are to be burdened at the fact that sin has touched this world and it touches our lives. And so when I'm praying and I'm pouring my heart out to God, I'm reminded that people's lives have been adversely affected by a disease called sin. I'm reminded that when Jesus was on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He wasn't just pointing the Jews at the time back to the Psalms and to what we know as Psalm 22 where he was quoting it and, and evoking all of the scriptures there. It was a prophetic statement that I'm the guy that David spoke about a thousand years ago. Go read the Psalm. It was very much that. But secondarily, it was also, I am feeling the weight I understand. I am a high priest. I'm standing before you and I will be before you on behalf of the Father. And in my body right now is the pain and the turmoil, not of what I've done, but of what have you, you've done. And so in this body, I am feeling the tension. I'm feeling the pain. And I'm ever mindful of what sin has done to you because what is spiritually happened to you. The way you have been spiritually marred is now happening to me physically and that I am being physically disfigured. 
And so Jesus, as a faithful high priest, all the way to the end, embraced the empathy that came from understanding the way to sin. And I want to tell you, when we pour out lamentation, when we pour out our heart to God, we bring our complaint. It's not just about us being disgruntled. It's not just about us being upset. It's about coming to the realization that the wages of sin is death. And it doesn't just impact our lives, it impacts other lives. And I don't live in a bubble. But if I have faith in Christ, then I carry the very life necessary to help meet the needs and address the brokenness of the sin around me. We lament, and God has lamentation built in, so we're ever mindful that what the world that we live in, it's not natural to watch sin play out. God wants our hearts to be expanded and have empathy for the sins, for the things that we see. Beloved, I would tell you that one of the things that God is opening up right now is a greater heart of compassion in his church. That that even this issue of racism and the way it has played out is because God wants us to increase in our awareness. Why? To expand a heart of empathy because if this gospel is going to go to all the nations and all the peoples, we cannot live in a bubble detached from each other. We have to have the heart of Jesus to see life come in, and we have to be so upset and so hurt and grieved over the state of sin. And that's just one. That's one. There's all sorts of sins. But we have to be grieved enough to say, Jesus, we need you, and we need your gospel. We need your transforming power, and we need your name proclaimed in all the earth. Getting a little ahead of myself. But there's an awareness that comes when we lament. That's the point I'm saying. So we bring our turn to God, we bring our our complaints, our lamentations, we pour out, but it's meant to do something in us as well. All right? Now, it doesn't stop here. I was reading to you earlier from Psalm 13. All right? Because buckle up. This thing's going for a ride. All right? Reading from Psalm 13. Notice that David says, how long? But then he begins to turn. He says, Lord, I need you to open my eyes. I need you to raise me up. Here's the third thing about lamenting. So we not only go to God, we not only bring our complaint, our trouble, our grief, but then we begin to what? Number three, we begin to ask boldly or pray boldly. Why? It all goes back to the fact, God, you're in control. You're on the throne. Your word is everlasting, and I'm going to pray it. So, Lord, I know it is not in your plans and purposes to see the enemy triumph. I'm going to be raised up. Lord, you're going to get glory. And so now I'm going to begin to pray bold prayers because what's in front of me, hear me, what's in front of me is not necessarily reality. What do I mean by that? It's true, but it's not the truth. These may be the facts in front of me, but there's truth that's settled in heaven. Come on, there's truth that's settled in heaven, and I've got more faith, God, in you to honor your word in my life than I do in circumstances in front of me to prevail over me. It hurts, it's challenging, it brings anguish, it brings pain, it brings tears, but Lord, you've settled your word in heaven. So now I'm going to begin to pray boldly that you break through in the situation right in front of me. But I've had setback, I've had hurt, I've had loss. I know. The Lord wants us to hold fast. Fast to his word. Ask boldly. Pain can create disappointment, but lament provides the language that dares to hope again. Lament invites us to ask for help time and time again. And that's here I'm here to tell you that lamentation is not just simply about sorrow. It's not just about emotion. It's about faith. It's about saying here is all that's heavy and weighty, but here is God. And though I start hurting, I finish in trust. And if I got to come again and again and again and again and again and again, God is going to get glory. Somebody give me an amen, so be it, thumbs up, fist pound, whatever you want to do. Get, get all emotional because that's true. All right. So David begins to ask, ask boldly. And that's where he says, open my eyes, God. Wake me up. All right. So I told you I'm going to give you these points quickly because we're going to land on Daniel in just a second, all right? Not physically, metaphorically, all right? What's the last thing you do at at the very end? Starts in pain, but then it leads to, and I've kind of just really said this, you you pray boldly, why? Because here's the last point of, of lament. You choose to trust God's word. You choose to trust God's word. 
Lord, your word is eternal. It is not marked by time. It has no beginning. It has no end. It has always existed. Jesus, you said heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Your word is more settled than the greatest building, the, the oldest foundation on this earth. Your word is settled in heaven. Let it be settled in my heart, and I choose to trust what you've spoken. Verse the calamity, the pain, the chaos of what I see right in front of me. As Christians, we believe in the goodness of God. Like I said, we understand that God has started a story, and there's an entire story arc from creation to restoration, and our lives are in the in-between. Listen, the in-between is messy. The in-between is not pretty. The in-between has highs and it has lows. It has mountain peaks and it has valleys. But guess what? God is the beginning bookend and he is the end bookend. And he is navigating the whole story in between. And our lives are in his hands. And there are bigger things than my physical address. There are bigger things than the state that I live in. There are bigger things than my nation. There are bigger things than politics and government. There are bigger things going on in the earth because he is Lord over all the earth. He is beginning and he is end. He is the first and the last. He is the so be it. So I choose to trust him when I lament. I finish and I land on trust in his word. I just want to do a roundabout churn the butter because there's no other, you know, come anyway. Here we go. Didn't plan on that. So it starts again. How long, how long, oh Lord? And then I will sing. He has dealt bountifully with me. All right, here's what I want to do. I've just shared those points with you. Okay, last two points, the, the two new points for today. What we pray boldly, ask boldly, and we choose to trust God's word. But now what I want to do is I want to look at the prophet Daniel. I just want to give you a couple of scriptures, give you the backdrop, and then I want us to be encouraged in this whole process of lament. I want us to see it all full tilt because I believe God has something to say. All right, I feel like a tennis match here. Boom, boom. Boom, let's go. All right, so if you have a Bible, I want you to go to Daniel chapter 6, okay? Daniel chapter 6, and I want to give you the background just very, 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 very quickly. Daniel, of course, is Hebrew. Daniel is of the nation of Israel. And I shared with you last week that what happened was that Israel is invaded and is overrun by a king named Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon. This is pretty significant. If you're familiar with the story of Israel right from the beginning of scriptures, all right, God has called 12 tribes into being. He has called this nation, and to this nation, he has made promises that he is going to bring the plan of salvation. He is going to raise up a seed or a son that will come out of this nation. These are promises, and it's going to bless all the families, all the peoples of the earth. This is all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, and we begin to see further detail in Genesis chapter 12 when God appears to a man named Abraham. All right, This seed, the promised one, Jesus the Messiah. But anyway, it promises Israel land as part of this blessing. It promises a place where they would be in, in prominence, that as salvation would come, that they would be priests unto God. And this, is, this marks the nation. And if you read your Bible, all the promises of God and all the prophecies of God revolve around what God spoke in Genesis 3 with the promise of this coming one. And, they, and even as this whole thing plays out in the days ahead, it all is about God's beginning and his finish line, all right? And so, but this is part of the heritage of Israel. And so what has happened is 150 years prior to the invasion that, I, uh, that I'm about to tell you about is that 10 of the tribes were taken by this nation, by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians repopulated the whole northern part of Israel, which had been divided down to two kingdoms. I know I said this last week, but I'm just recapping. So Daniel comes and, and his land is invaded, but where he is is in Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem is the temple of God, is the city of God. I mean, that's the prized possession. That's the jewel. That's, hey, that's where God has his focus. That's where the, the king is going to come and reign, right? And so the city is destroyed. The temple is destroyed. And then the best and the brightest, the, the royal family, the, the most intelligent people, all of that, they are taken by Nebuchadnezzar and they all are exiled. So there's been, a, within 150 years' time, there's been nearly a complete displacement of all the Jews. I want you to think about this. This blessed nation, this blessed nation, all these promises, completely ravaged, devastated. And then I share with you, Daniel's taken off into this land, Babylon, and he's made a eunuch uh, as part of the Magi and the wise men, which means they remove his capacity physically to even have kids. So the whole point I'm trying to make to you is I'm talking about trauma. I'm talking about things falling apart. I'm talking about when you look at where you lived, it's just smoke 
and rubble and what you know will now be abject poverty and destitution. That's real trauma. And so he's taken into this nation. And so right around the age of 15, we could say plus or minus whatever, a couple years, but as a very, very young man. And so I want to pick up in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. This is the background, so, okay? So does anybody think that qualifies for trauma, for pain, for hurt, for disappointment, for tears, for anguish, for sorrow or depression? I'm, I'm going to raise my hand and say yes. I think those conditions qualify for that, all right? Daniel 6, verse 10. I want us to read here. This is where there has been a, now a new king. Uh, a new king has come and conquered Nebuchadnezzar. All right, it's 47 years after Daniel has gone into Babylon, meaning he's approximately 62 years of age. The one thing that's known about Daniel is going to be revealed in this verse, and I want it to speak to us when we're talking about lament. It says in verse 10, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, what, what does this mean? There were men who didn't like Daniel and how excellent he was and how much he was promoted even by the new king, Darius. And so they said, we have to find something to accuse him. But because he was such a righteous man, they couldn't find anything. So what they did was they got a law created that said if you prayed to any other, uh, if you prayed to any God, if you prayed to anybody but the king, it's done. You're dead. Okay? There's no, uh, nobody else but the king. So they create this law, they create this legislation, and it says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, in other words, when he knew the bill had passed, he went home and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, very important, he knelt down on his knees three times that day. So he knew the bill passed and he knelt down three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. I want everyone to take that in, as was his custom, as was his custom. So for 47 years, he has been going on in his room or on his upper room, opening his windows towards Jerusalem and praying and thanking God. I want us all to take that in, okay? Let's fast forward now. Get your, get your fingers to do the walking or point on your pad or get your scroll going. Go forward to Daniel chapter 9. All right, because now we're going to move forward another set of years. We're going to move forward now 23 years. This is Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in desolation of Jerusalem. Verse 3, then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Pastor Chris, why are you reading these verses? What does this have to do with lament? How does this impact me in 2020? I am glad that you asked through me. Here's the deal. I want to show you a picture right now. I want to show you a picture of desolation. So if we could bring that picture up right now onto the broadcast. What you see here is devastation. Now this isn't Jerusalem, but I want you to think as you're looking at this picture and listening to my voice, when Daniel left Israel, when Daniel was stripped from Jerusalem, there was no temple standing, the city was laid waste, and it was left in that condition. Why am I telling you that? Look at this picture. When Daniel was opening his window three times a day and he was praying in this direction, thousands of miles away, this is what he would be looking at. This is what he was praying towards. Destruction. Death. Poverty. And brokenness. Three times a day he would open his window towards Jerusalem and he would, it would be something like this, thousands of miles away, and he's speaking the word of God, and he's saying, thank you, God. I want you to think about that. Fast forward to chapter 9, and it's been 70 years, and I read from chapter 9. Why did I read? Because Daniel understood, as horrible as things have been, 
as painful as things have been, as intense as things have been, I understand that there's a beginning and there's an end, that God has spoken his word and it's settled. And right now, as I pray out these windows, I understand there's nothing there. I understand the city has been laid waste. I understand that people have died in poverty, people have died in, in destitution, that there's brokenness, that things are overrun, that there's no temple, there's no holy place. All of it has been destroyed. I understand all of that. But here's what I know. I pour out my heart and I'm lamenting. I know the sin of our nation has led us this way, but I'm able to pour my heart out to God. Why? Because God began this thing. God made promises. God spoke his word. And I know because of sin, our world has been jacked up. And I know it's in this condition, but God's the story writer. God's the one who's faithful. God's the one who says, I'm watching over my word to perform it. And so even though it's broken, I'm throwing my windows up and I'm getting on my knees three times a day. And I'm saying, thank you, God, that you're faithful to your word. Thank you, though, I can't see anything. Thank you, though, there's pain. Thank you, though, there's hurt. You are still in this mess and I will stand here and I came as a teenager and I'm going to be here well past 80 but let me say this I will not move from the fact you have spoken and so I have more faith in your word which is eternal than I do in the imagery that's right before me that is destitute that is desolated you've spoken your word God and if you read chapter 9, I don't have time to read all of chapter 9. Chapter 9 is all about repentance, owning the sin of the nation, getting in there and lamenting. Why is this beautiful? Right around that same year when Daniel leads and he prays and he intercedes for Jerusalem and the promises of God for his people, the king dispatches a man named Zerubbabel, who goes and begins to lead a procession to rebuild the temple of God. Sometime after Zerubbabel, we have Ezra who comes and begins to reinstitute the teaching and the word of God in Israel, in Jerusalem. Sometime later, we have Nehemiah who comes along and begins to rebuild the walls. In other words, God is faithful to do what he said he would do. And there was one man while in captivity, one man while in pain and in sorrow, one man while living through trauma that could take any of us down, said, mm -mm, I'm not buying any of this for a moment. I'm not gonna turn my angst and my hate towards the Babylonians and all, all of that. God is faithful. God is faithful, and I will open up my window three times a day because I have more faith in what God has said than I do in the trauma and pain I am walking through right now. In other words, Daniel understood there is a redemptive story going on. There are greater purposes unfolding, and God will not waver from them, so I will not waver from God because he will perform his word. So many times as Christians, it's very easy for us to get caught up in the things that are happening in front of us and pain and trauma, but we need to be brought back to, I pour my heart out to God and I come to him because he's the author and perfecter of my faith and I lean into him when it hurts. Why? Because I know he's telling a story. I know he's got his hand. I know he's moving and I'm gonna see, even when it hurts, I'm gonna speak his word because it's settled and it's gonna show up. Come on. Let's take a second and just honor him and bless him for that. This is why lament starts with pain and it leads to trust. Daniel was faithful. Daniel was faithful with his spirit not to enter in to the discord and the strife, but to say this all hurts, but I'm leaning into you, God. How do you want to handle this? Because you are faithful. Now let's crank it up a little bit. This is why it's lament. If you had told Daniel early, early in his life that God was going to use exile to help advance his purposes, he probably would have looked at you like, what? what? What are you talking about? And sometimes we're very, very disarmed. But I want to tell you that God has a redemptive story that he is unfolding in this time. Well, let me say that again. God has a redemptive story that he is unfolding in this time. 
Daniel understood, Lord, you're doing something. And here's the question I have. We've been now in 17 weeks of pandemic and challenge. How many of us have looked and said, God, I know you're doing something. In other words, how many of us have looked to see for the hand of God versus focusing in on everything that's awful? I have a question because I've made some observations. Let me go back early on in the pandemic. We were about six, seven, eight weeks in the pandemic, and not everybody, but I saw this not just happen here, but I saw it across America. People were losing their mind over Bill Gates. Bill Gates is the Antichrist. Really? See, because I look at my Bible and I don't see that. Why is it that we're quick to run to these things and try and point out evil? How many of us are looking for the hand of God? How many of us are looking for the redemptive hand of God while we're in the midst of challenge? Listen, there's valid conversations to be had about government overreach into health and all of that. Those are legitimate conversations. But when we start trying to bring in books of the Bible and apply them to things that aren't pertinent to it, we're more prone to look for the offense and the evil and the trauma than we are for the hand of God. I'm looking for the hand of God in this time. You see, I'm encouraged because during this time, what I see, Lord, your church is fragile. Thank you, Lord, for a pandemic because we've got to put our roots down a little bit deeper. See, I'm looking for the hand of God. Lord, thank you because what's being exposed here is, Lord, you know what? As a church, especially in the United States, we need to study the scriptures about your return a little bit more. We need to understand the context because if we're running to the, to the creator of Microsoft and it doesn't match up biblically, and I'm having a little fun and I'm putting a little uh, you know, in there so some of you are offended, well, praise God. Go to him and lament and let God work it all out, right? But the point I'm trying to say is we need to look for the hand of God during times of trauma and pressure. We see, Lord, it's not fun. I'm praying for you to end this, but you've got something you're doing in this hour, God. And I want to look for that versus to stare endlessly down into the barrel of evil and find evil after evil after evil. Because guess what? You're always going to find evil after evil after evil. And if you keep staring at evil and never pivot and look at the beauty of Jesus, you're going to go insane. Why are we so conditioned to run to the worst when God says, look for my hand, my word is settled? My name is Dr. Rue. You can take two of those and call me in the morning. But let's, let's really now, let's, let's bring it up a little bit. Because sometimes we, we have this idea that God only uses perfect things to get his church to where it needs to go. Well, I, I go no further than the prophet Habakkuk, who when he says, look, the Assyrians are coming, God. I've been praying and you're not answering. He says, no, um, I've allowed them to be raised up because they're going to bring pressure that's going to help change my people. And some of us go, well, God would, God would never use pressure. God would, God would never use outside forces and things that are just oh, wrong or just darkness. Or He would never use that to impact his church. Well, go to Habakkuk. That was his prayer. Lord, what are you doing? God says, I didn't say vote for him. I didn't say I endorse him. They're going to be held accountable for their sin, but I've allowed them to be raised up because I'm more concerned with you maturing and growing and thriving and being healthy than I am in your personal sense of safety. I know a lot of people, that, that's hard to hear, but God will allow pressure to come, and God allowed that to happen with the Assyrians. Why? Because I need you to see that it's inside. It's what's going on. I need to bring something out. And we look at some of the things that have unfolded right now. We look at some of the things that are unfolding right now. And, and listen, I know we're looking out in culture right now. And I know we see things that are, that are traumatizing and hard. And we see responses and we see violence. And we, we've seen the evil, as I said earlier, the sin of racism and murder and brother against brother. Very first sin in the Bible. We've seen the, the degrading, the taking away of someone made in the image of God. And it's breaking our hearts. And we're watching all these other things happen, Right? And someone would say, well, God would not allow those things to kind of drive something in his church. Think again. Think again. God didn't cause it. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is sometimes pressure comes so that we as Christ followers will lo and will pour ourselves into Jesus and say, Lord, do something in me. God, do something in us as a people. Do something in your church. What do you want, God? What do we need to do? What do we need to take to you in prayer? He wants to shape us. Listen, that's easy to say, it's harder to live. Pressure is very important. Sometimes God uses pressure to get what he wants. Let 
Let me share this with you. How many, how many of you like diamonds? No, besides all the women. How many of you like diamonds? Let me, let me share this with you about diamonds. Let me talk to you about pressure and what God does. Diamonds are formed deep within the earth, about 100 miles, 100 miles or so below the surface in what's called the upper mantle. It's a part of the earth that's very, very hot. So there's a lot of pressure because it's so far down underground. It's compact. It's so far down, we can't drill there. We can't uh, get in there. We can't analyze it, all right? In other words, it's a part of the earth that we, we just know the generalization about, but there's pressure. We know there's immense pressure, and there's immense heat. And so when you have carbon in those conditions, you have a crystallization that begins to happen. And it's happening because of heat, and it's happening because of pressure. And so all the, as far as we know historically, from a geological perspective, all diamonds are formed at least this far down in the earth under intense heat and intense pressure. Well, like, what, well, if they're that far down, why do we see them on the surface? The reason we see diamonds on the surface today, the reason they can be mined, is because at some point it's understood and the evidence shows that there was a massive disruption, that there was a massive violent earthquake or trembling or shift under the surface that shot the diamonds up. It's not a process. You see, if carbon is moved slowly over time, it'll just turn to graphite. But there had to be a violent eruption. Hear me. What was done in isolation, what was done under the intense pressure of heat, what was done under super, super pressure comes to the surface through a quick and sudden violent eruption or earthquake. So you have this displacement that happens suddenly, and the, the sh they look at the shafts, and they say it's probably about 20 to 30 miles an hour that this violent earthquake or earthquakes have sent these things and released what we now see as diamonds and brought them into a place where we can see them. It's a special kind of eruption that shows a very, very deep work. Let's put this all together. God is wanting to use pressure in the earth right now. Because what's the issue? I told you when Daniel was praying, he understood, Lord, your word's established. You have promises that you're doing. Let me speak to you right now. If you read the Bible, there are things that are settled. And one of the things that is settled is what the church is going, is and is going to be. It is going to be a radiant bride. It's going to be a beautiful bride. It's going to be a suitable helper. It's going to look like Jesus, talk like Jesus, love like Jesus, have empathy like Jesus, have compassion like Jesus. It's going to be powerful like he is so that when he appears and he sees his church, you can say that these two belong together. They're suitable helpers. That's settled. So what that tells me is that while we're walking through things, I understand that the pressures and the intensity are building something. Why? Because there's a story that God is telling. And while things are down deep and things are heated, I understand God is doing some of his best development. Bring it all together. It's only when a violent eruption comes and brings those stones to the surface. If I had told you 18 weeks ago that within the scope of about the next three months, there would be three, or pardon me, two birth pangs that would rattle the entire globe, would you have believed me? Take a step back. Coronavirus has rattled the globe. The issue of racism has rattled the entire globe. There are birth pangs being felt. What future events are waiting that are going to thrust the diamonds that are being formed right now in God's house to the surface. You and I can't sit here and say, well, there are no longer global happenings that shake the earth. We've witnessed two and four months. What future things are going to be the eruption, come on, that reveal how you and I have cooperated with God in this time? Jesus has a beautiful church that he is making. Come on. Jesus has something he's doing, and what does God want us to lean into and be changed by during this season? How are we as brothers and sisters in Christ meant to look at each other and engage, and even over the racial issue, how are we to lean in, gathered around Jesus, and say, Lord, do your work in us. Lord, do your work in your church. Let your, the beauty and the wonder of the cross of Christ be revealed in your church now. Let's do the work now. I hear music. Do it now because you're forming something.
Because listen, guys, we've gone through a couple blips that are pretty intense. But there are other things ahead that Jesus wants to do. And the question is, will you and I submit to the heat and the pressure so that when the next thing happens, what comes to the surface is the diamond of his church. Right here, this is my passport. Do you know if if I wanna go visit someplace and I need to go get permission to go entrance into a nation, I can go down to Washington, D.C. So let's say I wanted to go to some place. Let's just say China. I know you're all upset. Just use it hypothetically. Here's the reality. If I want access to China, I have to go into an embassy. And the moment I walk into that embassy, here's what happens. The moment I step into that embassy, I'm no longer under United States law. I'm under the law of China. And as I'm in there, the laws of China apply. As I'm in there, if there's any music, it's Chinese music. If, I, if, I, if I'm in there, I didn't plan to go this way, but the food is Chinese, the drink is Chinese, the culture is Chinese. If I wanna know anything about China, I begin to experience it the moment I'm in there. So when I step in, I'm not in the homeland, but I know what the homeland is like because I've walked into the embassy. And if I want access, I'm going to request access. Can you, can you stamp my passport? Can I get authorization? Because I've been in the embassy and it makes me want the homeland. Let me tell you about what God is doing right here. The church of Jesus Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is an embassy. And when people walk into your life and my life, when they walk into buildings like these in our community, it ought to be an embassy of the kingdom of heaven. So when I walk in, the music speaks to me of heaven. When I walk in, the language is the language of Jesus. When I see how people interact and the relationships happen and the forgiveness and the grace and the trust and the healing and the restoration and the word, all of it speaks to me of heaven. It speaks to me of the Father. I know this is not the land, but man, when I walk in, it's a land I want to go to. You want to know what God is doing right now? He is raising up embassies. Because in the days to come, listen, in the days to come, it may get more intense out in culture, but let me tell you what, when it gets more intense and darkness covers the earth and deep darkness to people, guess what stands out? The embassies that have with them the light of heaven and people are going to bring the passport of their lives into your life and into mine, into local churches and say, I've tasted and seen. What is it required? Who do I go to to get authorization because I want to enter this land? And we bring them before the great passport stamper whose name is Jesus. And the beauty and the wonder of the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords puts his authorization on somebody's life when they bow at his cross and say, I I found refuge now in a new home. Church, to this multi-generational, diverse house and to the people watching, I speak to you. Jesus is building his church. It's settled. And the only issue now is whether you and I cooperate. So we can walk through the tough issues ahead and do what God told us to do at the beginning, right before this pandemic. Gather around him. Come back to the table around the body and the blood of Jesus. And walk in grace, empathy, love, prayer with each other. Or we can reject all that. The choice belongs to you and the choice belongs to me. You see, here comes the sift and you can begin to shift and experience God's lift or there comes the sift and you can get caught in the rift and you can begin to drift. Choice is yours and mine. You want it? You want to be a diamond? You want it? You want to shine? 
It's the hour we're made for. This is the cross that we're leading to. This is the resurrection we experience. This is the Zoe life of God that's meant to flow out of us. This is that time. I pray you're encouraged. Let me finish with this. When Jesus lamented, I shared with you on the cross. I shared with you earlier about the cross. When Jesus embraced that lament, when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he took that sin upon him. He knew that the cross was not a stopping place. It was just a place you pass through. It was more than a minute and it hurt, but here's the deal. I can enter into the lament. I can enter into the pain. I can enter into the prayer because on the other side of it is glory. On the other side of it is victory. On the other side is a greater glory. And folks, if this is the proving ground, if this is the training ground that we're walking through right now, then what type of glory does God want to put on his church in the days to come that's going to reflect to the world around it the beauty and the wonder of Jesus, the the awesomeness of what it means to be one new man in him. What beautiful, radiant bride does he want to show to the world around us? I'm excited because it's already settled. And now we're just jumping on. So I hope you've been blessed this morning. I hope you've been encouraged. Really feel like God has given us something here so we can help interpret the times that we're walking through. Yield ourselves to the Lord. Watch him do what he needs to do and live out well the days ahead. I want you to join me in prayer. Father, I just thank you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just thank you for your word right now. Father, I just thank you that you, Lord, you're you're bringing something to our lives. And so right now, we just lift our hearts before you, Lord God. Lord, we we have, Lord, for for quite a few months, and just in these, Lord, all all the way up to this week, Lord, we're experiencing, Lord, pain and challenge, and we've seen things, God. And Father, I know some of us have have, have lamented it, and we've lifted it out. And Father, we feel like we, like, we know it's challenging, but we're in a good place. But I know, honestly, that there are others, God, watching right now or listening who are not. And you've brought this word to bring us back to the fact that you're doing something extraordinary in hearts and lives because you have people that you want to see come into your kingdom. You have people that you want to bring into the family. And so I pray that we would do this well. Lord, help set our hearts right now. Thank you, Lord, that we're not just pouring out our emotions, but Father, we're coming to you saying, Lord, it hurts, but you're working and you're doing something. And I say, yes. I choose to trust in you, in Jesus' name. Listen, before we close out in prayer, here's what I want to do. I just want to say this. If you're tuning in today or you're you're listening or you've jumped on for a few moments, I'm here to tell you that Jesus has lamented over the sin that, that besets all our lives. And this is how much it meant for him to do that. He went to a cross and he died for your sin and he died for my sin. He knew that sin produces death in both you and me, separates us from God even causes physical death. And Jesus says, I'm going to come and deal with the separation that you have from God. I'm going to deal with your issue of physical death. Jesus comes and lives a life without sin, dies on a cross for our sins. In his body, he took the weight and the wrath of the punishment for your sin and for my sin. And he died and he bled out for you and me. The Bible says three days later that he rose from the dead. The Bible goes on to say that by faith in this Jesus who is risen, he is the Son of God. That if you confess with your mouth that he is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And I just want to challenge you right now. If you're listening, you're watching, I wonder, have you made a decision to follow him? Have you purposed in your heart to pursue him? And I pray that you would reach for him right now. Just say it. Just say, Jesus, I believe in you. You are God's Son. And right now I choose to follow you from this moment forward. I make you the leader and Lord of my life, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time or you've been away from God, we want you to text DECIDED to 97000. Text WOL DECIDED. WOL DECIDED to 97000. We want to interact with you. We want to pray with you. We want to bless you. Okay? Now, for the rest of us, I really want to encourage us in this whole concept. We have challenging days right now. Hey, listen. We're made for this hour. We're made to rise up. We're we're raised. We're going to rise to see the hand of God move in this time. All right. We love you. We bless you. I want you to be looking ahead in the days ahead for how we're going to have registration starting Tuesday for our services on the 28th. 
9 a.m., 11 a.m. in person. 11 a.m. will be our new broadcast time on Facebook and YouTube. Happy Father's Day. Go in the grace of God. We bless you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we say amen. Amen.